So let's read together from verse 26 of chapter 2, 1 John, and we're going to go through to the end of verse 1 in chapter 3. Now it's a, it's a bit strange place to start the reading, but it says, I'm writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. As, you know, as for you, the anointing you receive from him, from him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and, has anoint, and is in, that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it has taught you, remain in him. I'm going to read that again because I made a right pick zero of it, didn't I? Okay, let's start again. I'm writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. As for you, the anointing you receive from him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it has, has taught you, remain in him. And now, dear children, continue in him, so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Now up to this point in the letter of John, he's been talking about the need to be a Christian. About the need to understand who Jesus is and his place in your life. <coughs> despite the pressures from the outside, of the people who are anti-Christ, and that, that's not the anti-Christ, it's talking about people who are anti-Christ, okay, and trying to lead you astray. Because John's trying to explain to us, if Jesus isn't Lord of all, then he's not Lord at all. And this then results in living in the light, his light, which means reality, having our feet firmly on the ground, expressing a spirituality that is rooted in our humanity. That's a phrase I use a lot, and I, I hope it burns into your soul. You see, what we have here is true wisdom that produces a sanctified common sense that enables us to engage in a realistic way with those who don't know Jesus yet. And let's think of it like that. There's a lot of people who don't know Jesus. They don't know him yet. Maybe we're the agent to actually tell them who Jesus is. If we are children of God, that is our role. It's about knowing our own limitations. It's about understanding that under God we don't need to develop this a, a sort of a personal public profile because you see in God's economy we don't have to prove anything to anyone anymore. There's the person and the persona. Everyone's got a person and a persona, haven't they? You know, we should be the sort of people who are saying what you see is what you get. Okay? That's how real it should be. I remember my pastor teaching me that. And I remember he, he was interviewed for the church that he eventually went to. And I remember him moving. And he, he didn't want to leave the church he was going to. He was coming from. And he didn't want to go. He'd been there, he planted the work. It was going great. But God was moving him on. He was resisting and resisting and resisting. And so in the end, they, they took him for an interview. And um, he said, right, okay, I'll come for an interview. He didn't have a shave, right? And he put his dirty old sweater on. And he went in there and he went in for the interview. And he sort of gave gruff answers to all the questions. <clears throat> and it became clear to him in the interview that actually this is God's place for him. And they said, now, is there anything you'd like to say to us? He said, well, there's just one thing. And he rolled his sleeves up. And he said, look, there's nothing up there. What you see is what you get. And they accepted him and he had a, a really successful ministry for quite a number of years afterwards. And it was remarkable what God achieved through him because he understood that it had to be God's movement. Now the thing is, so often in this life that we live now, in our society now, we th feel we have to project some kind of persona and give this image to people. So we spend time beautifying ourselves, don't we? Yeah, I'm as guilty as everyone. Do you know, I even try to comb my hair. <laughs> Until my family tell me how ridiculous I am. But the fact is, we don't need to prove anything to anyone. God receives you as you are. And he will make you into the child of God he wants you to be. And we're, th we're further encouraged not to go bush or not to go native. And allow the attitudes and the things of this world to influence us to the point that they take the place that Jesus should have in our life. And how easy is that? You know, if we've got a family, for example, you've got a home to keep. The bills have got to be paid, haven't they? That's common sense after all. 
And it's easy to put a priority on those and get dragged bound by those rather than put, give God his place and say, Lord, you've got to help me here. That's the intimacy we were talking about earlier. How many times have we been there when we've just said, Lord, you brought us here. You've got, you've got us into this. You've got to get us out. Because we have to be obedient and go where he wants us to go. And that, of course, can be anything, you see, from a person to a habit to a sport to material objects. It can be anything that takes Jesus' place in our life. Actually, truth be known, we live in a spiritual minefield. And it's only the light of Jesus that enables us to negotiate through that minefield. Then, as if to complicate matters further... We t- we're told that there will be people who masquerade as agents of light, but their sole aim is to lead us astray. And they can come in all forms. It could be the pastor. It's not, I promise you, it's not. Okay. <laughs> now I've got to try and dig a hole. But the fact is, there are those who are out there who are agents of evil, and they just want to lead you astray. They want to take you away. They want to focus you elsewhere other than Jesus Christ. So your question has to be asked, who would be a Christian? You know, it's not an easy option, is it? So the view of the victor. Right, life of the Christian, you know, is fraught with danger. It's fraught with difficulty. What does Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul say in Ephesians? He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. He knew it was tough, okay? Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle... It's not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you've done everything, to stand. This isn't about winning the battle, this is about standing in the battle, and that's victory, isn't it? Being more than, a, more than victorious is actually victory in the midst of the battle. Stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled round your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. And in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Oh, I feel another series coming on. Okay. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. This is about engaging in life, isn't it? It's about knowing the stuff of life, knowing the energy of God as we walk out day by day throughout, throughout whatever we've got to do. Knowing the Spirit of God. And as his thinking develops, John begins to encourage us as his readers to face the enormity of the task by focusing on our true identity as the children of God. And he told us in those verses from 26 to 27, the fact is you've received an anointing. Others will tell you it's not an anointing. But the fact is you've got to get a grip and hold on to the truth that you know is real. That is the truth of it. Get a grip. You know, as soldiers, we're told that all the time. Get a grip. Get a grip. Get a grip. Of course, when we, we have contact with Jesus now. We have contact with Jesus in our devotional time, in those conversational moments in the house and the car. Do you have conversations with Jesus in the car? Do you? Come on, admit it. It's not sinful, honestly. It's great. <laughs> A relationship is about a relationship. It's about having a conversation. And sometimes, you know, when the spirit just moves you, I always find it being convenient because he wakes me up at night. And that's, I said, but Lord, I want to sleep. You know, but it doesn't matter. He is there. But because we can't physically see him now, there are times we find it difficult to make those right connections. And too often, because we can't see him, we make decisions as if he wasn't there. Now, John gets that. Because, you see, he knew Jesus as a friend before he was crucified. He had him there, and he lost him. Then he gained him back after the resurrection, and then at the ascension, he lost him again. But that, then Pentecost came. So if any of you are finding being a pilgrim confusing and difficult, well, spirit of thought for the likes of John. Spiritually and physically, that was just an emotional roller coaster for him. But John, you see, joined up the dots. 
He made a move into an understanding of faith that enabled him to view the reality that he was experiencing in the moment as that which is transient in nature. This life is just passing. That's all he's saying. And over all the events that seemed to crowd in and want to suck him dry was the reality of the fact that he is a child of God. And that's where we are now. This world is passing. It doesn't matter what pressure you're under. The fact is it's passing. You are a child of God. You see, because it's about faith, isn't it? And faith is what? Being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Now, the word certain in Greek is the word reality. It's not just saying, oh yeah, I'm sure. It's about the reality, living in faith, living in the presence of God, knowing that he has a purpose for you, knowing he has a direction for you, knowing that he sees you and he understands exactly what you're thinking from moment to moment to moment. And there is the key. Look at verse 28. And now, dear children, continue in him so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he's righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. You see, the operation, the operation of the deceiver, who would do anything to shake the foundations of our relationship with Jesus, and robbing us of any certainty. That's what he wants to do. He wants to shake that, so you actually start doubting. Once doubt enters in, then everything starts to crumble around you, doesn't it? We've also here got a bit of a cop-out for many people who quote these verses out of context. Because it's easier, you see, and it's easier to, to do things and be, be comfortable in doing good things without having to be accountable for your actions. I'm righteous because I do good. In context, what we're seeing here is the natural consequence of one in relationship to the divine, bearing the marks of the Father. So what you do is a result of what you are. If you're a child of God, then you behave as God acts. We are, you've heard me say it before, royal children. We're expected to have royal manners. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. What comes to your mind when you hear lavished? I tell you what comes to my mind is this big chocolate cake. And, <laughs> right, right, and, and well, Rachel makes a great chocolate cake, and, and when she put, but it's not complete until the chocolate's on it. And the chocolate goes, and she lavishes the chocolate on it, you know? And it's, that's how good it is, isn't it? This is the, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, says the AV. And I think that's a beautiful way of putting it, and very poetic, but lavish sounds so much better and much more tasty, doesn't it? This is what God wants us to see. How great is love the Father has lavished upon you that you should be called the children of God and that is what you are. And you've heard me say it again before. He uses an exclamation mark, which is what? It's an excited full stop. That's exactly what he's saying. Get excited about this, people. You know, I, I remember some friends of ours and they, you know, she's in heaven now, but they, they adopted two children. I didn't have a clue that they adopted the children. And they were about our age. And um, when I was, I was talking to her about it one day, and the daughter and the mum were sitting there talking together, and they laughed the same, they looked the same. You know, it was just everything about them. And I said, you know, I, I've rarely met a mother and daughter are so alike. And they laughed even harder, and she said, we tell him. And I said, well, I said, um, Karen's adopted. She wasn't blood. But you see, she'd been with her mum and her dad for so long, she even began to look like them. Beware, didn't I? Right, okay, okay. You might even grow my ears. No, no, you won't, I promise. But you see what happened? She became like her mother. And that's how it is with the children of God. We become like our father. We can't help ourselves. The more time we spend with him, the more time we do things with him, the more time we spend in relationship with him and talk with him and love him, and listen to his spirit, the more we become sensitive to him and more we become like him. And we might not even notice, and that's the beauty of it. Because that's where humility comes in, and when you know you've got it, you've lost it. Okay. See, the statement of facts with a promise has been laid out before us. Now we have a statement of fact with the reason for all the difficulty as we travel this journey through the world. Look, says John, look at how great this love the Father's lavished on his children. We're not just talking about getting all your Christmas presents you asked for. We're seeing eternity in a moment. 
As we open the eye of faith and see what God has gifted us with, as we understand that he sacrificed Jesus, his only son, so that we have the right to be called the children of God. Even angels long to look into these things. See the reality, Christian. See it. Shake off the lethargy that has jaded the fire of new life. As children of God, we're above the rampant fatalism in our world that sits back and then accepts inevitability, whatever that is. You know something? As we get older, and we are an older group, we feel our mortality a little bit more keenly, don't we? And do you know one of the problems we've got? Because we know we're not as physically able as we once were, we become a bit more careful, don't we, about everything. You go careful about how fast you walk. You're careful about choosing which routes you take when you go shopping. Make sure you don't take certain steps. Anything that's fast moving, you don't. Yeah, and that's quite right, and that's sensible. But you know, for the Christians, spiritually, this time when we're older is a time of opportunity. Because all of this experience, all of this faith, all of this long relationship has to offer is available in abundance. And the church needs, the church general, needs the, the outpouring so that the next generation can learn and enjoy the glory of the children of God. Because that is what we are. How will the children know if we don't show them? See, that's the view of the victor. But then there's a the cost of change. Now, while we glory in all this truth, Satan, the great deceiver, will do all that he can to undermine the truth and kid you on that this is just a feel-good factor. It was just a good Sunday, folks. It was a nice Bible study. But that's nothing to do with reality, you know. You've got to get back to the real world. And I'll tell you a really good example of this is when you become a new Christian. And you're full of excitement. And you're full of wonder at all these good things that have come with trust in Jesus as your saviour. And what do you do? You, what is the first thing I say? Go and tell your family and friends. That's the first. Go and phone someone. Tell them. And you go to tell them about this remarkable discovery. It happened with me. And usually that's the first bucket of cold water that's poured over your head. Because your enthusiasm and your expectation of, of some kind of rapport with them is met with suspicion. Or met with looks of concern and pity because, well, you're obviously a weak person and you need a crutch. And then it's given a title that actually normally accompanies you through life. It's called Your Faith. You know what they say when you're having a tough time? They say, never mind, you still have your faith, don't you? Or they say, I wish I could have your faith. And it doesn't matter how many times you tell them, it doesn't seem to dint their armour of self-sufficiency. And, God, and John gives a good reason. He says the reason the world does not know us is that it does not know him. If we are truly God's children, then we have to respond to the challenge of the fact that despite our personality type, we cannot become grey. We cannot become part of the background. This is the truth for us. If it is the truth for us, sorry, then actually what we're doing is becoming complicit in Satan's lie that being a Christian, belonging to God, being his child, knowing that our sins are forgiven, knowing that this life is a journey to heaven, all this is really nothing much to write home about. That's what happens when you become grey. And I know that's a hard work, but you see, liberating truth always comes with a cost. The cost of commitment to Jesus Christ and his church. The cost of putting him first in your life above family and work and ambition and property and anything else that's taken his place. The cost of being vulnerable. Oh, that's a tough call, isn't it? It's particularly tough for us in the West because we bought into this philosophy of self-sufficiency and privacy. You see, none of us minds giving and serving. But when it comes to being served, when it comes to being ministered to, well, that's a time of grace that we don't want. Because what it does is exposes our weakness and it allows folk into our space. And heaven forbid it would let the Lord into your space as well. Let me tell you something. He knows that already. 
and that's what causes your pain. You know, I read a, a great story um, this week of um, a shepherd, um, and the shepherd had been talk, talking to this chap, and they were in the Highlands, and they, they were talking about how sometimes a sheep, to get a fresh pasture, will, will jump 12 feet into a hole to find fresh pasture on the edge of a cliff or something. And when the person asked him, so how do you get them out? He said, well, what I do is I leave them. He said, what do you mean you leave them? He said, well, he said, I'll go in. I'll wait until they're that weak that they can't move, and then I'll go into the hole and I'll pull them out. He says, but why do you do it? He says, well, we are really silly sheep, aren't we? Because, he says, if I jump into the hole when they're in there, first of all, they will jump over the precipice rather than let me grab them. <laughs> He said, and that's like so many Christians. They won't, they won't go back to God until they have no friends and they've lost everything. And he said, if you are a wanderer, I tell you that the good shepherd will bring you back the moment you have given up trying to save yourself and are willing to let him save you in his own way. So if you've trusted Jesus at some stage, if he's far away from you at the moment and you are one of those wanderers, stop trying to save yourself. Stop trying to do it your own way and surrender your life to him because he is the only answer. You know, when Jesus walked this earth, he was dismissed as a pretender. He was thought of as a peasant's son who had ideas above his station. He was the one who caused an uproar everywhere he went simply because he asked the why question. At his crucifixion, a lot of people always thought, well, that's just bad luck. The Apostle Paul puts it this way. We, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. You know, we, some people just can't see it. And if we would just open the eyes of our hearts, then we would know who we really are and the possibilities and the glories of reality would just blow us away. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. Let me just read a short poem. I ask myself, child of God, do you see the pure, the pure beauty he puts before your eyes, those twinkling stars shining at night and the blue filling the daylight skies? In beholding this spectacular scene, has there been gratitude that you've shared to its marvellous creator, to whom there is no other that can be compared? I ask myself, child of God, do you see those about you that have special need, that God's placed in your path that can be helped if you take time to intercede? Perhaps you should pray with them or for them. Either way, God hears the prayer that will give spiritual encouragement to help them overcome a burden they bear. I ask myself, child of God, are you aware of the lost who you pass, you pass by most every day? Then are you very faithful in presenting their condition to God when you pray? Whenever the opportunity is given, are you quick to tell of the God you serve, of how he richly blesses you and gives you far more in life than you deserve? I say to myself, child of God, there's been many things in life you didn't see. Therefore, instead of being a help to God, you failed these rather miserably. Today, God has strengthened me, made me wiser, giving me a clear vision to see. With every life that he allows me to encourage, he will gain the final victory. Shall we pray? We do bless you, our Heavenly Father, that you love us with an everlasting love. That we are your children and that we can know that we can live in the liberty of the children of God. And so today, as we begin this new calendar year, help us to remember just who we are. Help us to glory in it. And help us to understand that this world is passing by. But at the end of it all, we can trust you. In Jesus' name.